we all like uh, to hear s love stories. Uh, you all reacted when you saw uh, Christoph and uh, Erico come here. <laughs> you know, we all uh, love to hear uh, love stories and things like this. But the question is, how do you sustain that love? How does that love will grow and last for a lifetime? And becoming a Christian is a lot like, like that, actually. It's a love story with Jesus, and it's really wonderful. When we discover the infinite love of Jesus, when we feel, we will feel like the, the lame beggar at the temple gate, as described in the book of Acts. He, he, he stood, he jumped, and he praised the Lord, and he was so excited, couldn't be contained. They told him to shut up, but he would not, because he was so excited for the great miracle that he had received. So the burden of sin is gone. You feel free, you feel peace. You are so filled with joy, hope, and excitement. I don't know if it's true of you, but it certainly was true of me when I received Jesus. So it's like I remember that night I went back home. I was supposed to go party, but then I was saved that day uh, when I went to a meeting and I received Jesus in my heart. And I went home and I came to my mom and says, Mom, I'm born again. I did not fully understand what I was saying, but I knew that it had happened into, into my heart. I'm a brand new creation and it just feels wonderful and kind of uh, f falling in love with Jesus. Say hi if, uh, if you believe that, okay? So uh, uh, hi or amen or yes or whatever you want to say. Uh, these are wonderful feelings that we have when you meet Jesus. But wonderful feelings as in a marriage life does not last automatically, does not always go on like this because trials, disappointment, burdens, tensions, and adversities come our way. It's part of being human being. And when it comes, it darkens our world. So the question this morning, how do you go on walking with Christ? How do you keep your initial love fresh and alive uh, and uh, when you keep your excitement with Jesus? Would you like to keep your excitement for Jesus? Yeah. Do you still have it? I hope you do, but sometimes can we feel a bit less excited and we feel like uh, it's not there anymore. Don't feel like I used to in the past. So let's go to slide number two in Colossians chapter two, verse six and seven. And one thing I want to say is that in the text we are going to look this morning in chapter 2, I want to mention before, very important, the unity of the message of Paul in the book of Colossians. Chapter 1 last week continues into chapter 2, so don't, don't forget what we have seen in chapter 1, because it will become very, very important for us this morning. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. So that's the, the beginning uh, scripture that we are looking. Point number one this morning, we must go on with Jesus the same way as we have received Him. And I, I want you to stop and think a little bit. How did you receive Him? How was he presented to you when you received him? What was the message? How did you receive uh, Jesus? And this here, the word receive means a uh, um, really near, intimate, uh, familiar way, a relationship. And the important part of this text also goes in verse 7, uh, just as you were taught. Remember how the message of Jesus was transmitted to you. It made you receive Jesus. Do you remember? I remember my wife and I, we were in the hospital room trying to convince Bridget's sister to leave the faith that she just had uh, started. She, she, she was saved while she was in the hospital. We had heard that she became crazy because now she was reading the Bible. And she was believing in Jesus, talking about God, hell, and all these things. So he says, let's go rescue her from believing these foolish things. That's how we walked in the hospital, with the intentions to bringing her back out of that foolishness. Can you imagine? That's how we went to that hospital. And this is how the message has been transmitted to us. You know what we've seen when we walked into this hospital room? 
we saw our younger sister sitting on the hospital bed. I, I said that a long time ago in the back, so let me refresh your memory. That was my first picture of what a Christian looked like because I had never seen one. I, I was raised in the Catholic and traditions and things, and then in the teenage years, we just walked away and forget about everything about religion. But that day when we walked in the hospital room, she was sitting, she looked well, she had a Bible, a little concordance, like a mini concordance in a book, a notebook and a pen. So to me, that's what a Christian looked like. A Bible, a notebook, a pen. That, that, that's, that's what a, Bible, uh, a Christian uh, has to be like. And she started to tell us that Jesus loves us. Of course, especially me, I was quite aggressive and rejecting and argumentative and telling her, that, ah, you don't believe this book. You know, do you think that all the wisdom is contained in one book? Look at all the books we have in the world. And I tried to influence her to turn to magic and astrology. This is much better, you know, and uh, you will find more wisdom outside of the Bible. And this is how the, the message of the gospel was transmitted to me at first. Uh, not the first time it was transmitted, but the time that it was transmitted where God used a divine action to convince me. When she saw that we were uh, rejecting her message, she went in the bathroom and she cried. We didn't know that for at first, but she told us later, she cried. Because how can we reject the message that Jesus loves us and we are just making f uh, foolish comments and argumenting against that? So then the Lord inspired her to talk about the return of the Lord, how it will be, and the prophecies, and that has shut my mouth. I became speechless. And I was so shocked that what she was telling us from the word of the Bible was actually from the Bible. And that led me to buy an old Bible in a flea market and start to read the Bible and, and then. But the conviction started there. So what I want to say to you this morning is remember your own story. How was the message transmitted to you? Who transmitted the message to you? It may be your parents. Sometimes many people are raised in a Christian family. We say, oh, my, my parents were Christian. I grew up in a Christian family. But they did not receive Jesus. And many of them walked away for a while and rejected and was indifferent and all this. But there was a transmission of faith. This Wednesday night in our Bible study, it was so good. We had so much a good time because we were discussing like that. And all of us were sharing how we were changed when we first uh, accepted Jesus. And we had a visitor with us. So we all introduced ourselves by name, where we're from, and see a little something about how you receive Jesus. And it was one of the best uh, nights we've had. And learning about each other's stories, how we came to Jesus, was really a, a lot of fun. It was very pleasant and encouraging to, to be part of that uh, evening. So I want to insist on that because it says, as you receive Jesus Christ, in the way that it was transmitted to you. What kind of Jesus have you received? What kind of Jesus has been transmitted to you to convince you, to convict you of sin, so that you say, I want to receive Jesus in my life. I I'm ready. I, I know I found what I'm looking for, and this is it. I I'm there. I'm just like that. So think about it. It has been transmitted either from a friend, or uh, from uh, family members, or uh, from the church, going to church by invitation. But besides that, there needed to be a divine <coughs> moment, a divine connection, a, a miraculous connection that only the Holy Spirit can do. And then Jesus was revealed to you as wow, as awesome. Can you see Jesus is awesome this morning? Yeah. Yes, Jesus is awesome. Amen. So Paul is reminding us of that. And Paul himself received the gospel from Jesus himself. He passed it on to Epaphras. Epaphras transmitted it to the Colossians. And uh, through the word of God, it was passed on to us. So 
this is important because you will find this truth uh, repeated in the words of Paul, in the word of John, in his letters, as it was transmitted. Like in the first Corinthians chapter 15, the gospel, you have received the gospel, you have believed by which you were saved, as it was uh, transmitted to you as the apostolic message and the, the letters of John you will see the same thing as it was the apostolic message as the apostolic message received so we don't receive Jesus by listening to false teaching by cults or by religion you receive Jesus when the message the apostolic message the truth of the gospel is div divinely revealed to us amen, amen. hallelujah uh, say amen louder than this because it's a, it's, it's a great topic. It's a great topic. So they receive the, the Christ from the testimony of Epaphras and they decided to trust in Christ. So Paul does not really focus here on how specifically you receive Jesus, but on what kind of Christ have you received. Uh, who was the Christ that was revealed and transmitted to you? How big was Christ revealed to you when the message of the gospel was transmitted to you? Was he big enough to save you? Was he awesome? Was he like the one that lifted your, your, your burdens and all of these things? So I want to come back to the background of last week because last week in chapter 1, and this is part of the unity of the message, Paul exalted Jesus as supreme over all things. Because remember, in the book of Colossians, there are a group of false teachers who are spreading a false teaching. Paul never visited that church. He is not the one who planted this church. Epaphras is. But he heard about what's happening in the church. So he wrote a letter of concern to them and to to fight back or to defend their faith or to protect them as a good shepherd should, he present them the Jesus that you and I should believe in. This is the kind of Jesus that we must receive. So in chapter 1, he presented Jesus as the one supreme, who has the preeminence, he's supreme, he's superior, he's, he's above, he has the supremacy of all things. He redeemed us. And in Him, all of our sins have been forgiven. He is the image of the invisible God. That's how we could see how, understand how an infinite God is by looking at Jesus Christ. He created all things. He was before all things. He created all things that exist. And in Him, all things goes on and on being held in Him. He's the sustainer of this world. Not only He created the world, and then He abandoned us to the loss of uh, chance. No, he is, he is there. He is part of his creation. He is interested in his creation. He is also the head of the church so that, and that's the, the, the climax of Paul's argument, so that in all things he may have the preeminence. And Jesus dwells all the fullness of God and through him, even though we were enemies and we didn't deserve uh, the grace of God, even though that, he reconciled us to, to God. Okay, so that is chapter 1. That's what we have discussed uh, in detail last week. So this is the Christ that the Colossians have received. And this is the Christ that you and me should have received, the, the kind of message that was transmitted to us. For me, I know that the night I received Jesus, I knew that I had found a Savior, the Lord. I'd given my future to Him, and it was awesome, awesome experience. So then, this is the God, the, 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 the divine being that, we, uh, that was transmitted to us. So in the next slide, we will see the, the verse 8. So that now that we have received this Christ, we should go on walking with Him. And then we will come back to that verse a bit in a moment. Rooted, uh, being built, established in the faith. So that we don't have to be taken captives by false teaching. Because Christ is so important. He's so big in our lives. We have discovered that He is above everything. So we don't have to turn to any false teaching anymore. So the expression is to be robbed or to be taken captives. What happens when someone robs you? 
you lose what is yours. You lose the blessing. If in that case, you lose the blessing of knowing Jesus. You lose the blessing of your faith. And you become a captive to the false teachers. He succeeded to deceive you and to convince you to follow him or, or their, their, their group. So you are a big loser when you do that. But if you have found fullness in the truth of Jesus Christ, when they come your way, they are not going to influence you. They are not going to bring you by their philosophies. You know, they are not going to rob you of your faith. Philosophies and human reasoning are limited and they are flawed. They, they are corrupt, they, they, they are damaged, but they are still have a lot of power of influence o over us, these worldviews. You know, there are new values accepted. We often read and on the internet or whatever it says, we read a lot about the millennials, we read about the change of cultures, the new values that we have to face in our society. And it is true that the, these values seem to make sense. The arguments, the human arguments seem to make sense. It seems to be logic and everything. They carry a great power of influence over uh, uh, the young generation and even Christian all over the world. I want to give you an example of that, the change of our values. Uh, uh, because maybe I'm a missionary, but I was shocked when I came to learn this news. Um, I read an article lately about uh, making sense of slain missionary John Chow and global missions. Did you, how many of you know this story about John Chow? Oh, we need to know that. On November 17, that's not very long ago, John Chow, young American, 26 years old, was killed while he tried to reach out into a remote island belonging to India, where they have a primitive people that were protected it was forbidden from outside world to enter to this place. And then he, he, he prepared and he went over there. So the point that I want to say, I mean, I admire what he has done. And I think if John Chow would walk here today, he would be our hero to all of us. But listen to what happened uh, and the, the world view at this time. John Chow was killed by tribesmen of the remote North Sentinel Island while attempting to share Christ with them. His death made world news. So it was all over the world and sparked mostly negative and antagonistic reactions toward the ideas of mission in general. So he's not considered as a hero, as a brave young man. You know, every day you read and the uh, headlines of your uh, internet news provider you know, like this child is uh, cleaning up the beach and she's a hero. Uh, this child is uh, uh, gathering some money to help uh, some dogs uh, somewhere or whatever cause. And they are good, good cause. And these people are praised beyond, you know, everything. They are like uh, heroes to us. And here is a young man who gave his life and died because of his conviction to share the love of Jesus to a, a tribe that is lost in the south of India. And he is just hated by the world to a point where many online comments have been celebrating his death as taking another crazy religious zealot off the planet. So he gave his life, he's 26 years old. This guy is intelligent, he's committed, he has prepared for years, he, is, he has believed what we believe. He has believed that in the 1040 windows, this is the last remnant of people that we need to reach out to. He believed it and he prepared for it. And he's not a crazy guy. His wife said, Chow was intentionally preparing for many years. He's 26 years old, but for many years. By getting a degree in sports and medicine, training as an EMT, studying as a respected linguistic institute in order to learn this undocumented language. This guy is not crazy. He prepared there, he had a, a target, he prepared for years. His purpose with all of his training was to live on the island for years, 
build a relationship with the people, help them through his medical training, learn their language, and tell them about Jesus Christ. And uh, this is the re response, the worldview, how worldview look at mission today, global uh, worldview. Chao was a soft-spoken, very gentle man, and the reality that this entire idea of sharing the gospel with the world is offensive to many is a sign of the change of values in our society. And uh, one of the articles I read was they were comparing John Chow to Jim Elliot. How many of you know Jim Elliot? I think you will know him more. In 1956, he went in South America to a, a, a tribal people and just as he was trying to reach them, he was killed. But in 1956, when he died, the, he had the front page of Life magazine, and he stirred up a mission growth. He stirred up interest in that mission. That's in 1956. In 2018, the same event, it could be Jim Elliot again, and it is like uh, antagonistic, like they celebrate his death instead of praising the courage of this young man. That's how our world is changing. Another example, actually I have an article here that maybe many of you would w want to, I just read it from uh, um, newyorker.com, I think something like that. So please uh, read this article. It's, uh, it's not really like, a, if, it's not for or against, it's just presenting a lot of good things about how this man prepared, telling us more about his life, and it's really, really good. Um, another thing that I want to, to bring to you today was, uh, I'm listening a lot to uh, audio books. And then uh, one of the audio books that was offered to me for, for free, it's called uh, New Family Values. And it uh, redefines what it means to be an ideal family in America today, in America in the West, in the modern global uh, society. It says the conventional family, family has broken into multitude of families, including gay families, multi-parent families, adoptive families, foster families, families built through assisted reproduction, single parent families and all this. And we see again in this one uh, a lot of change in our society. Society is changed. Where do we stand with our faith and our reaching out, uh, succeeding uh, wisely, creatively in such a changing world to go on believing. And I want to see this here, it just came to me this morning when I was uh, reviewing my notes. Be careful not to let anyone rob you of this faith through shallow or misleading philosophy and uh, the world's way of doing or seeing things. The danger today for the Christians is not like a person, a, a false teacher, it really, I think most of us are wise enough to know the content of the scriptures uh, quite well. To, to know when, uh, like, uh, Jehovah's Witness or the Mormons come to you, you have already some uh, basic understanding and uh, self-protection uh, truth in, in your heart. I'm thinking about these new values. When we talk about the philosophy, be careful not to let anyone, not to let these new values, the, the cultural worldview, influence you. Because what I see in, in Canada every time I visit, is I see that many people are taken away. The, these, many of these worldviews make sense in terms of arguments, in terms of human justice, in terms of governments, uh, politically correct uh, things to do, things you cannot say or do, uh, the position of the government on this and that in society. You cannot say like this or you will be a, a hate hater, a hater of the Muslim, a hater of the gay community, a hater of this or that. So it's not, I don't think here, this moment in this room, we have to be afraid of these false teachers or false teaching. I think what would be more dangerous to us would be to slowly be um, engulfed and to uh, drifting or accepting or moving into uh, accepting this worldview and losing the strength, the power, the initial excitement of how big Christ is. 
You, you all said amen before. How big Christ is to you. And that's the message of Paul to us this morning. How big is Christ to you? How awesome is Christ to you? What he has done. Is he supreme over all things or not? Would you do what John Chow has done? Yes. So would you do? Would you be ready? Would you have that kind of uh, uh, zeal to f f further the call of God into your generation in spite of op strong oppositions? A lot of countries are closed. And this article here that I, whoop, I printed this morning is uh, discussing uh, what, how some of the mis modern missions uh, methods are using to enter into some closed countries <coughs> and sometimes they are blamed. I remember that you know I came to China I am here at, standing before you because God called me to I'm saying it today smuggle Bibles into China I was breaking the law every time I entered this country I was a lawbreaker but I believe that this is what God called me to do I came because of that. So when I read this article of John Chow, I feel a connection with him. I, if, if I'd be 26 years old, I'll be in a boat with him, going to the, these, these people on the island. That, that's, that's how I, I think, you know. From, I, I received Jesus Christ, I was 26 years old, and I became crazy for Jesus. Are you crazy for Jesus? Not, n not, not, no? Are you? I'm not saying, are you crazy because of Jesus? I'm not what I'm saying. I'm saying, are you crazy in love for Jesus in your heart? That's what we need to rediscover. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. So, let's go to the next one. I need to check the time as well, because we have an AGM. I just use another Bible version here of this verse. Same verse as we've seen before. Just as you receive Christ as your Lord, so continue to walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and firm in your faith, just as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. If you look at this text, you will see that Paul used various images. Walking on a path, being rooted as a tree, being built as a building, overflowing like a, you know, a flooded river, and these pictures help us to know how we ought to keep on walking with Jesus. With this excitement, with this same zeal, and not to be taken away by these uh, new values or uh, philosophies that surround us so much. Walking. The verb walk here is in the present tense. It describes the ongoing process of the Christian life. Live in him. Many Bible you translate the word uh, walk by live. Live in him. You, you live the life according to what you believe. Uh, pursue. And this message this morning is uh, pursue Christ further beyond your salvation. Because I think this is very, very important. And if I remember the many teaching of Pastor Steve uh, found, was planted the foundation of the church is very much built on that idea. What happened in your Christian life, in the way that you live for Christ, in your service for the Lord. Uh, that, that you are accumulating rewards. You will be brought into the judgment seat of Christ by the way uh, that you live for the good that you have done in your life. So we live according to what we believe. We pursue Christ further beyond your salvation. Because I think that so many of us, we are so happy to be saved. I don't have anything to do anymore. <laughs> I can just sit in church and enjoy every Sunday. That's what Jesus saved me. That's not the message that we read in the New Testament. There's a call to go further beyond salvation. After salvation, what's next? If Christ is exalted, if he is supreme above all things, that should mean something to us this morning. Someone was sharing in a Bible study fellowship recently that the participants 
have expressed that they prefer Bible discussions that does not demand further study during the week. And at first I didn't think about it, but later on it came back to me, it made me think, is it an indication of people's spiritual condition? I remember when I believed in Jesus, there was never enough reading of the Bible. Even four o'clock in the morning, I was still reading the Bible. And a few months after my, my conversion to Jesus, I had filled three notebooks. I had a little uh, concordance, and I had filled three notebooks filled with scriptures according to different topics and themes. I enjoyed the Word of God. When we came in Lighthouse, you remember some of you years ago, inductive Bible studies, the precept course training, we had to study a lot every day of the week so that on the next meeting we would have a, a, a rich and a mutually encouraging uh, discussions on the Bible. But today, is it a, is it a reflection of where we are and our understanding of Jesus? I'm sorry I don't have time to study during the week. W okay, fine, I know we are all busy. N last Monday I made a test. I encourage you to try to do it, and maybe you do, some of you will do it much better than, than I have done. I decided I'm not turning on my computer because uh, Monday is my day off. So, wow, it was so hard. <laughs> it's been one of the hardest things ever. I was telling Bridget all day, well, no, I'm not going in the room. I'm not pushing the button on. And I still had my phone, though. <laughs> but I, I, I refrain on the phone as well. But I did not sit in front of my computer. And you know, it made me think, wow, I have time to do other things. I have time to think. I says, if I would go back living without a phone and a computer, I would have to buy a house, a garden, or plant something, or paint the walls, or build something, do something like uh, instead. But I'm, I'm making a point that we don't have time to study the Word of God during the week now. Is that right? That's, that's very sad. Honestly, that's very sad if that's the case. Sorry to throw cold water on your head this morning. <laughs> when mom and dad were teaching on middle six and Sunday afternoons here at church, what will happen, think about that, when God's people refuse to spend their time to study God's word? What happens next? What happens to this church? What happens to you individually? And Paul says it somewhere else, for the time is coming when people will turn away from listening to the truth. Uh, we don't have time to, to, to listen to the truth during the week. Sunday is okay, or the, the night of the fellowship is okay, but I'm not preparing ahead of time. I'm not giving it more time. Lovers of pleasures more than gone. You know, walking is not really as impressive as galloping on a horse or uh, running a marathon or something like this. But if you keep walking in one direction, you will get to your goal. It, re it implies daily effort and progress. Rooted. Rooted is from agriculture, isn't it? Rooted is very important because without roots, there is no growth. There is no plant. And uh, there's a, uh, anyway, I, because of time, I'm not going to talk about it. I was going to give you an illustration where I was planting trees in the Rocky Mountains, but I'm skipping that. Roots are the hidden part of your life. N no other can see that. This is your roots. Christ see that. Others don't see that. It's your secret life with Christ. You know, on Sunday, outwardly, you all look like wonderful Christians. You know how to shake your hands, you know how to hug, you know how to say amen, praise the Lord. We all know how to do that. We look like perfect Christians here. But how is the hidden person of the heart? That's the root. We don't see that. It's the secret life. By the way, I will shock some people. Be, attach yourself to your chair. Last Sunday morning, in this church on the fourth floor, somebody stole 3,000 Hong Kong dollars to someone else. 
So we have people eventually maybe in the, in the, in the church or maybe it's a, among the visitors. I don't know. I'm not blaming. I'm not searching. But somebody was taken 3,000 Hong Kong dollars. And that is an indication of something as well. Being built up express another aspect. It's more ar uh, arch architectural uh, illustration. Uh, the energy, the progress that you can see, the steady progress. Every week I go to the gym in Shangshai on the 13th floor and I saw this, this building starting from the ground up and it's coming up with this. And both the roots that you cannot see and the, the, the coming up of the building that you can see are two aspects of the growth that Paul is talking about as a result of having discovered how wonderful Jesus is. How excited, because remember it says, just as you have received him at first, go on living with him and him. Go on walking with him in that same way that you have been. We talk about maturity. Maturity is not automatic. Salvation is not spontaneous. Salvation is free. It's by grace. It just happened when you believe. But the, the growth process is not spontaneous. It requires the root, the planting of the root, the time of maturing, the building up of the building, and the becoming firm, established in your faith. It's very important, as you were taught. The overflowing with thankfulness, I believe, Paul repeats the the importance of being thankful uh, four or five times in that short epistle of uh, Colossians. It's really important to be thankful. Um, this is a picture of a river overflowing its bank. Um, our growth must be motivated by how awesome Jesus is. I repeat it often, but that's, I think, a key. I learned a lesson while preparing this message uh, from marriage. When a man and a woman, a married man and a woman, are thankful for each other in their marriage, think about how their marriage will be celebrated every day. Their marriage would be fun, their marriage relationship would be healthy, it would be fulfilling. Because they are thankful for each other, they are, they are grateful, they, they enjoy, they see what they can bring to one another. And it will protect, think about this, it will protect the couple from infatuation. It will protect the couple from having an affair outside. Because they are thankful and they are grateful at home, they are not thinking of outside. But the, the opposite is also true, and it is true also of the Christian life. If you criticize each other and you're always grumbling and you're never happy with what you have and you don't see the good in your marriage relationship, or if you are quick to see problems all the time and criticizing other people as a Christian, you will be more inclined to fall a prey to the, the false value of this world and everything. So that's, that's a warning for us. And the last point, live in his f fullness. And I think that is very, very important for in him. And again, Paul is making a point uh, bringing unity among chapter 1 and its conclusion of that section here. For in him, all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. And you, say you this morning, you. or me, 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 okay, and you, I have been filled in him who is the head over every ruler in authority. You have been filled in Him. God has made you complete in Him. Filled to the top. Look around you. You, are, you will find people searching for something to give them a new excitement, a boost. People seem content, don't, don't seem content uh, uh, with themselves. The, this, uh, this feeling, this inner vacuum, and uh, people are, feel incomplete. And Christ will fill this vacuum. Jesus Christ is fully divine. He has all the attributes and the character of God in Him. And because of Him, you attach to Him, you walk in Him, 
And I want to make a little point here about the in him that is repeated a lot in, the, in this letter. Many times we will use for him. You see, Christian, we like to use, oh, I walk for him. I serve him. I do something for him. But that's not the message of Paul here. The message of Paul is not you do for him. It's you stay in him. You stay attached to him. You stay dependent of him. Because when you say, I do something for him, it's you take the credit. It's your abilities. You are dependent upon what you want to do. You're so good for God. Have you ever had this feeling, I'm so good for God. God must be so happy to have me because I'm so important you know, for him. I do so many things. That's not the message of Paul. The message of Paul brings us to humility and it exalts Jesus Christ. And it says, in him, you keep on walking in him. Because in him, you will draw the fullness. You will draw access to God. You will draw the power that you need for miracles. You will draw the inspiration for prayer. You will draw the heart for the lost. You will draw compassion. You will draw from Him what He is. Say amen to that. Amen. The fullness of God. So anyway, I want to stop here because that's what I want to say and that, that's it. Spiritual growth is something that does not happen spontaneously. It's not by addition, by adding this, by adding that. Spiritual uh, growth is by nutrition. You bring your root in Him and it will grow. You keep in love with Jesus Christ. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You are a new person. You are equipped for that kind of life. You are satisfied in God and you are ready to go for God. Maybe there are some days you don't feel like full. You don't feel like what we are reading. Like uh, you have been filled. I'm full. I'm filled. I, I have Christ in my life. I'm so satisfied. But sometimes we don't feel like that. It's like, but believe it. The full power and the presence of God in Christ. Maintain the relationship. Rooted, built up, and established. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's stand this morning and celebrate the powerful...